Alrighty, folks. So Ms. Tierney is a friend. She and I served together on the SEC Committee for Advisory Committee on Capital Formation for um, small and emerging companies. Um, she has been um, general counsel of Second Market. She is VP of New Business Strategy, awkwards, at NASDAQ Emerging Markets. Ah! There this is go. Jonathan Nelson. <laughs> I'll let you take it away. Go ahead. Um, are my, my slides up? Yes. Sorry. So Jonathan actually is a friend, even though he knows nothing about me. Um, hi, everybody. And I have until like 1.45. So you just cut me off when you need me to stop speaking. So I'm um, with NASDAQ Private Market. I'm based on the East Coast. But we have a West Coast, um, big West Coast presence here as well. And NASDAQ got into the private company space about two years ago. Uh, we ended up doing a joint venture with an entity called Shares Post, which you may be familiar with. Um, and it was really funny because NASDAQ private market was trying to compete with second market in the private company secondary space and wasn't really piercing the uh, veil that we created. And they hired me, and then we did an acquisition to acquire the part of second market that deals with private companies. Thank you. Whoops, whoops, whoops. Okay, so today our focus um, at Nasdaq Private Market is we, we realized fairly early on that the best way to provide service in this space is to be a, basically a service provider to the private companies. So we would never transact in shares in a company without the company actually engaging us to be involved. And Doing a little bit of history, back in 2010, 2009, 2010, second market got into the private company space because we were getting inbound requests from shareholders in Facebook and Zenga and some other late stage privates saying, you know, we see that you make markets in liquid stock, can you, oh sorry, illiquid securities, can you help us find a market for our shares? So we end up finding buy side location for really big, well known companies. We were running Facebook auctions of Facebook stock or at the beginning, like once a month, and then more towards once every week, towards the end. But Facebook was a real anomaly. They were already over the 500 shareholder limit that existed at that point in time. They were preparing to go public. <clears throat> they didn't really care who bought their stock or at what price. Um, and that's where we were able to run the auctions. Most other private companies we were talking to did not want that kind of unfettered secu uh, securities trading. They cared about who bought their stock. They definitely cared about the price. Um, they cared about uh, allowing people to sell. They wanted employees to stay in the game. They didn't want people to be able to sell out of their position in the secondary markets without some kind of restrictions. And what we saw, and our, I'm sure you're seeing as well, over the past, I'd say, four or five years, is private companies really loading restrictions on top of equity grants and purchases of securities so that most companies these days <clears throat> will not allow a shareholder to transfer securities without actual board approval, or there could just be a blank prohibition on transferability pre-IPO or acquisition. So in that kind of environment of companies really wanting to control liquidity, what we've done is create basically a release valve for the, the buy, sell side um, pressure that ends up crewing over the length of a late stage private company's life. And if anybody has questions, feel free to, except for Jonathan, um, feel free to ask questions. <laughs> Do you know where I work? Yes, okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what does that mean? So NASDAQ Private Market, we offer three products, a cap table management product, what's a, pr a private tender offer product, which I'll talk more about, and a private M&A transaction product. So what happened was, as we went through the like, kind of life cycle of the companies that we were working with, what we focused on was, the companies who wanted to provide liquidity wanted to do it in a completely controlled manner. And what that ended up being was private tender offers. Um, SEC has a lot of rules for public tender offers, which are very onerous, a lot of disclosure information, a lot of different rules. In the private tender space, there's a couple of really important rules. The transaction has to be open for 20 business days, and some level of disclosure needs to be provided. But that's more or less it. So, most of the private companies we work with today, a lot of unicorns and decacorns that are well known, 
um, and a lot of other companies will offer periodic liquidity. Maybe it's one time event, one time a year event, or maybe it's two times a year. And they'll say to their shareholders, okay, I'm, we're going to let you sell, and maybe you're an existing employee, and you can sell 10% of your vested equity. Maybe you're a former employee, and you can sell 20%, or maybe they're trying to clear up your cap table, so you can sell 100%. The company either buys the stock back itself, or identifies generally large institutional buyers who are wanting to get onto the cap table, either increase their existing ownership percentage, or they want in, but the company's not willing to do a primary company and the buyer negotiate the price, and the entire transaction is run through the NASDAQ private market platform purely electronically. And if anybody in the room has ever been involved in a tender offer from a paper-based point of view, it's really a nightmare. You have to check every document signed properly, that people haven't tried to tender more than they legally can. All that's done on our platform electronically. So it's a really good solution. And what we're seeing is, um, and I'll show you, let me see, get to the stats. Whoopsie. Um, what you'll see is we did about 1.6 billion in private tenders last year. To date, this year we've done 544 million, which is a huge increase over last year. Uh, we've had a big increase of 20% of programs this year. 67% <clears throat> were share repurchases, so the company's buying the stock back itself. And about 70% of eligible participants were current employees. Average age of client was nine years, 500 plus employees, though we've done programs for much smaller companies than uh, that kind of number. And most of them were 300 billion plus in valuation. So I think what we're seeing, and I'll go back a slide, is that as companies choose to stay private longer and the shareholder base grows over those years, you know, most private company employees have an equity uh, grant up front, vests over four years, at four years, five years, six years. The company's doing well. They're saying, I want to buy a house. <laughs> I want to live out here and actually not live in you know, a box um, or buy a car or whatever else people want to do. And what was happening was what we started seeing were companies that provided secondary liquidity actually had a significant edge in the employee retention space. So if you could say to your employees, listen, you come work here. We'll provide liquidity on a you know, kind of a regular interval basis maybe at year seven, eight, nine, people know that they'll be able to actually get some value out of the hard work that they're putting in. When I was at Second Market, private company at the time, you know, we got our upfront grant at year five. I'm like, hey, I'd like to actually sell some of this. And that's when we started doing tenders for our own employees. And it really made people happy. Even getting a small amount of liquidity, 10% a year, is meaningful when equity is the bigger part of your compensation. So that's what we started to see. Um, you know, I think the last number I saw, I'm not sure, I know they shift every day, but there's upwards of, Jonathan, do you know how many unicorns there are now? Last number I saw was like 170 something. So that's a lot of private companies with a huge number of shareholders that may never go public, may go public at some point in time. But if they want to retain their share, they want to retain their employees, they want people to join the company, this again is becoming an important tool for recruitment and for retention. Okay, and then um, this just gives you an idea of the types of who we normally see in a program. Um, the nice thing about the private tender offer rules is that you can create different parameters for different buckets of shareholders. So as I said earlier, you could choose to let all employees sell one percentage, former employees sell another percentage, angels and others sell a different percentage. It's up to the company. I think the rules basically need to treat like buckets of shareholders in the same manner. So I think most private companies are utilizing this as a tool to help their employees first and then maybe let other shareholders get some liquidity as well. Um, and you can see a lot of the securities that sold on our platform were was preferred stock, then common. A lot of companies are allowing their employees to exercise options and immediately resell the underlying common. So this is a great way for people to fund their exercise and tax costs. Um, and also it's been a really helpful tool for employees. Okay, so uh, because I'm a lawyer, I can't help myself. I think securities law is really cool. It's, it's, who doesn't? Everybody love like securities? Okay. So when we started working in the private company space, you know, lawyers, in-house, external counsel, we care about making sure the company's not violating securities laws. And the basic premise of the SEC rules around 
uh, securities transactions are either you have to register the transaction or you have to have an exemption for registration. And in the private company space, there's only a couple of ways that you can sell your securities under the securities laws without triggering problems. Um, if anybody's familiar with it, the most prevalent exemption prior to last year was Rule 144 that said if you own stock for at least 12 months, we're talking private companies here, if you own stock for 12 months, at the end of the 12 months, you could freely sell the securities without limitation. The problem there is that at, in the context of 144, if you're an affiliate, so you're an officer, a director, a high-level executive, you can't rely on 144 unless the company you're working for is willing to provide public information, which none of us were willing to do. So most affiliates can't rely on 144. Then there's this idea, it's kind of a made up legal construct referred to as rule four, it's now rule four A one and a half, that sort of said if you don't sell, if you only sell to accredited investors, if you don't generally solicit, um, if your company's not making money um, in the context of the transaction, there's this kind of legal construct called four one and a half that lawyers are writing legal opinions on that let you sell under the federal, under the federal laws uh, without having to register the offering. The problem with 4.1.5 is because it's a made-up legal construct. Um, it doesn't actually give you any relief from state law. So what we started seeing through the transactions we were doing were the companies that were trying to shut down secondary trading. They would ask their sellers for federal and state-level opinions to show that they had valid exemptions to sell at the state and the, and the um, federal levels. State law in the context of secondary private transactions is a mess. Um, we did a pretty big deep dive survey and I never thought I would say this, state law, who likes, nobody likes state law, nobody, okay. Um, and what we found is that even though states would adopt the same exact language, their courts or their commissions would interpret that language completely differently. And there are basically four transaction um, exemptions for secondary resales at the state level one was um, sales to institutions, but like the state of Mississippi would call a human being who made a lot of money an institution, which made no sense to anybody. There's one for uh, resales on an isolated basis. So if you sell just a few times a year, there was a st state exemption, but every state had a different number. So if you were trying to do sales into multiple states, it didn't work. So we started talking to the state regulators, which are called NASA. One of my colleagues at Second Market said, not the rocket scientists, which was kind of mean, but maybe a little bit true, um, about need for a new federal level exemption to allow resales of secondary securities, because that money goes right back into our communities. So if you are an employee of a private company and you're selling your stock, the money's going into the community. And we kept saying, okay, well, this is good for states because it drives tax revenue, more sales, right? Income tax and capital gains tax. And they really liked that. Um, but the states, I think, have some trouble getting out of their own way in some ways because there's 50 of them and it's hard for them to agree. So what ended up happening was um, Second Market had worked on a couple parts of the JOBS Act. One was the threshold change from 500 shareholders to 2,000 so that now private companies can stay private almost as long as they want to because the 2,000 number excludes employees who took shares, former existing. And... Uh, the general solicitation piece of the bill gave private companies a lot more flexibility to be private, raise a lot of capital as they wanted to. But as that happened, again, on the secondary side, you had these limitations that made no sense. So about two years ago, how am I doing on time? Am I talking too fast? Okay. Um, what we, so about two years ago, People we had worked with on the Jobs Act approached us and said, where else do you think we need to see change in the market? Where other legislation do you think we need to see? And we started talking to members of Congress about the need for a new secondary resale exemption, which is now referred to as, uh, it's now Section 4A7. And the original premise was we were going to try to codify that kind of non-safe harbor rule for one and a half, or one and a half, and say, okay, you have this construct out there, the states are comfortable with it, the SEC is comfortable with it, lawyers are comfortable with it, let's try to make that a federal exemption and take the states out of the equation. And so in 2015, the bill, which was, I think, a pretty good bill and not a lot of problematic language, went through the House Financial Services Committee and passed with all Republicans voting for it and all Democrats voting against it. So that was just 
the nature of the house back then. So in 20, wait, no, that was 2014. In 2015, we did a revised version of the bill, because if, this is the other thing I think it's good to know, right? Getting legislation through Congress is not schoolhouse rocks. There's no nice, like, no guy sitting on the steps saying, it's really easy to get bills through Congress and everybody gets along. It is a ridiculous amount of inter, you know, infighting and a lot of bipartisan um, activity means a lot of give and take on both sides. It's great when it gets done, it's very effective, but getting it through is really problematic. So what happened in 2015 was we found bipartisan support, but that bipartisan support led to some language being put in the bill that wasn't originally um, part of what we thought would work. So that's what I'm referring to is that the new 47 exemption um, requires that private companies provide some level of disclosure to, their, to the transaction participants. And so what we did at Second Market is we went through, or at NASDAQ Private Market, excuse me, we went through the last two years of private transactions that we had done through our platform, these secondaries, and said, okay, well, in all the cases that we've seen, we did require the disclosure to be provided. Private tender offer rules say that some level of disclosure need to be provided. And we went through and said, how often did companies give this information to participants to get a sense of whether private companies would generally be available, be sorry, willing to make that level of disclosure available. And these are kind of the results that we found from the programs that we'd seen over the past two years. So we looked at 70 liquidity programs, 3.5 billion, and these are the requirements. One is that companies provide the most recent balance sheet and P&L statements for the past two years. The rules require that they be audited. And we had 76% of the companies we worked with had provided that in the context of the private tender. And then the rules also require a P&L statement dated within six months. 38% provided it, but that is a little bit skewed because a lot of our programs occurred in the first half of the year, so it wouldn't have been applicable to them because it's a six-month requirement. So it would only be required in the second half of the year. Um, people, companies have to provide the total, nares, total number of shares outstanding as of the most recent financial year. We always got a summary cap table, so that wasn't a problem for any of the issuers we were working with. The title and class of security, name of issuer, um, these are kind of basic stuff. I think every company is doing a secondary transaction is providing this kind of information. Then they need a disclosure about whether a seller was a control person. Um, it's 84% provided that disclosure. Names of officers and directors of the issuer, you know, it's on everybody's website, but the SEC rules now require that you actually provide it in the context of a data room, so that wasn't a big deal. Par value of the security, no problem. Um, address of principal office, description of business. Most, almost every company we'd worked with provided a description of their business, or again, it was available on their website. And then name of a broker dealer or agent that was being paid. Most of the transactions we do do not include an intermediary. We were, we were the acting as the information and paying agent, so we were naming ourselves, so that was super easy. Um, and then if there was a transfer agent that wasn't the company, you had to provide their uh, name and the contact details for who the transfer agent was handling your transaction. And so at the end of the day, this got signed into law of December of last year, and I think it's a really helpful tool for private companies who, again, want to provide liquidity to their shareholders and solve for state law issues. Um, and um, we're seeing, again, a growing level of comfort with private companies who are willing to provide liquidity. They're looking at 4A7 as a good opportunity to provide a clear and, federal, clear and um, concise uh, federal safe, safe harbor to do so. And I think we're going to continue to see this growing uh, in a big way going forward. Again, if like if private companies are coming to us saying we're losing employees because we can't provide liquidity, they now want to provide liquidity. I have talked really fast. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Jonathan, I don't know what else to talk about. Should we talk about what we're doing at the SEC? Um, yeah. Why don't you come back up? Jonathan's a troublemaker in DC. Nobody will be surprised by that. I am. Um, one of the questions that I have always had with um, startups and buying stock is why, you know, if I'm raising money as a startup, I'm selling my stock. Um, and then 
where do those people make their money? They have to sell their stock a second time, and we need to thaw that stock so it actually flows and becomes liquid. Um, a number of the things that I've kind of obsessed about is how does this happen? Why does this happen? I would actually like to ask um, you, would you actually see, because I know that a number of investors would actually like to have more options to get secondary liquidity on their stock, like early angels and that sort of stuff. Do you actually see that happening more often with not necessarily maybe decacorns, but even like burrocorns, you know, like $100 million and up sort of companies? It's mine. That's your a burrow? Okay. Um, so I think what we're seeing is as there are a growing number of private companies who are saying, we're going to stay private forever. There have been companies who have come out publicly and said that. They're moving towards more comfort with trading market type of transactions and secondary securities. Um, kind of like we did in Facebook back in 2010, 2009. I think that as the market develops, and 4A7 is a big help for a trading platform because it creates a federal exemption for the resale, so you have to sell for state. So if like now it's like private market, we made a decision to get into a trading space again, I think we'll see more and more companies willing to allow accredited investors to buy their stock. Um, Right now it's institutional, right? Right now it's T. Rowe Price and it's Tiger and it's Sequoia on the opposite side of the tenders on our platform, big institutions, generally not people. But there are a lot of people who are getting in through SPV vehicles. So I think we're seeing a growing number of platforms who are crowdsourcing, not in the crowdfunding way, but basically referring to as accredited investor crowdfunding. They're pulling together pools of accredited investors and they're investing as an SPV so that you know, human beings can get into these investments. Um, I think that is going to continue to accelerate. And I think if you get into a space where companies have much more comfort about a trading platform that they understand, that's controlled, that they can say, yes, turn on an auction or turn off an auction, I think you'll see more ability for angels and other early investors to get out. And part of our policy argument in Congress, 447, was you allow an angel to get Angel specifically was one of our speaking points. You know, if you let an angel get out of their investment, they're going to put the money right back into another company. Like, they're serial investors. And so that's good for the economy and good for job creation. And I think that was a really resounding message for the people on the Hill. They care about job creation. They care about what investors, what angels are doing with their money. And they want to make that uh, simpler to do. Um. How fast do you see this market growing? And is it a fact of companies being comfortable letting their stocks be traded or auctioned on the private market like Facebook was? Is it um, the market getting more comfortable with participating in those sorts of offerings? Or is it a chicken and egg problem that both of them are kind of happening slowly at once? Well, NASDAQ private market was originally structured to be an intermediary trade and uh, intermediary trading platform where sellers and buyers be brought through intermediary broker dealers and transactions happen through the platform. So that was the original premise two years ago. Um, there are platforms to do that. Shares Post is still doing one off transactions. There's a platform called Equity Zen in New York that's doing kind of more one off transactions. But there's nobody doing, and I don't want to say OTC, that's the wrong kind of connotation, um, but some kind of a regulated trading market, I don't think you're ever going to see a bulletin board for private company stock because, for very good reasons, companies have restrictions on transferability. So I think what you might see is a company saying, I would like to run an auction process in my stock so that there's a competitive price set that would advantage my shareholders as opposed to the tender, which is a fixed price. So if a company is more comfortable setting a price in a competitive pricing fashion, Again, keep in mind that the negative, potential negative outcome of that is an impact on the company's 49A valuation because your independent, uh, independent uh, analyzer, <laughs> your analyzers um, are taking secondary transactions into consideration when they're setting the 49A valuation, which is why companies are very focused on maintaining some kind of limitations around that. But if you could say, okay, here's a range that we're willing to allow the securities to trade within, 
and assuming that's completely fine under the SEC rules, which I think it is, then I think you'll see more competitive pricing models become acceptable to companies. The Facebook auctions, I mean, we were very happy about it because we got a commission on the transactions, but the prices were outside of the realm of the IPO range, so to speak. And I think Facebook got a question about that from the SEC. You know, we're seeing secondary transactions at significantly higher prices than your IPO range. But the good news for Facebook was it was so widely dis held and so widely dispersed that the total transactions in the, in the mark in the, in the, sorry, total secondary transactions kind of in the year ahead of the transaction was like less than 1%. So it was really easy for the underwriters to say, you don't have to look at that trading, it's literally one, less than 1%. Um, but the prices were extremely aggressively priced, especially leading up to the window shutting down for transactions. So I think we would just have to come up with a mechanism that make companies comfortable, that they can somehow still limit trading price in a manner that doesn't impact their existing employees, bit getting you know not a, not a fair pricing on their 49A valuation. Um, I have another question, and um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening with like the Reg A um, mini IPOs, um, and do you see that is kind of coming at this similar sort of market from the bottom up, um, and then another market kind of coming from the top down with the large companies? Um, I don't know, that's just one of the questions I've wanted to ask you for a while, and we're in a, we're, it's my event, and so I'm gonna ask it to you. <laughs> Does everybody know what Reg A Plus is? Yeah. Anybody know, people not know what Reg A Plus is? Okay, good, I like to explain things before I, I talk about them. So part of the Jobs Act, there were five pieces of the Jobs Act. One was a th change to the shareholder registration threshold. It used to be if you had 500 shareholders, you had to register with the SEC whether you wanted to or not. That's why Google went public. That's why Facebook went public. They had too many shareholders, and they triggered registration with the SEC. So the bill that got passed in the Jobs Act increased that number to 2,000 shareholders and exempted employees. So that, and employees are the vast no, the vast majority of shareholders in private companies. So at a 2,000 number, you really can stay private as long as you want. Another piece of the Jobs Act allowed companies to generally solicit when they're raising capital privately. Another piece of the Jobs Act was something called IPO on-ramp, which was a lot of accommodations for companies that are going public for the first time um, at a billion dollar valuation or, or less. Um, it gave you confidential filing with the SEC, it gave you um, some um, waivers on some uh, expensive disclosures that public companies have to make. So that was that piece, the IPO on-ramp piece. There was the crowdfunding piece that the SEC just passed last year, finally, that allows companies to crowdfund um, with significant <laughs> stupid parameters built around them and insane disclosure, but I don't have a view about crowdfunding. And then there was the Reg A+. Plus. And so going back to, I don't know, older than me, um, there was a SEC safe harbor for companies to raise up to $5 million a year. And not very many companies took advantage of that because you still had to satisfy state law, which again is a very problematic thing to do. So in the Jobs Act, the SEC passed a new safe harbor called Reg A Plus, people call it Plus, even though it's an amendment to Reg A, that allows companies to raise up to $50 million a year there's two tiers, one tier that lets you raise up to 20 million in a year, one tier that lets you raise up to 50 million a year. Tier one, you have much less disclosure obligations, but you have to deal with the states. Tier two, you have disclosure obligations and periodic disclosure obligations for the first year after you actually raise capital, but you don't have to deal with the states. So we're seeing, oh, and the other big part of um, Reg A Plus is you can sell to retail investors. So you don't have to limit your investor base to accredited investors, you can sell to retail. The retail investors are capped at how much they can invest on an annual basis across all the Reg A Plus offerings, which is kind of silly, but you know that's where the rule is right now. So what you're seeing is, I think companies in, in, in probably not high tech, probably not fintech, but I would say consumer goods, um, anything retail oriented, uh, community banks a little bit, biotech companies are all looking at Reg A+. And think about it this way. Does everybody know about Elio Motors? You heard of Elio Motors? 
So it's like a really cool, right, like a motorcycle chassis, three-wheel car that's being built, two-seater, great for commuting. They raised, I think, 20 million something plus under Reggae Plus. They had 14, something like 14,000 people indicate interest in the transaction. And they're trying to get the word about their products. So it was a brilliant marketing move to get out and say, hey, we're building these super cool cars, low environmental impact, small chassis. So for them, they immediately created a consumer base as well as an investor base. And we're seeing that across other types of companies. Yeah. No, no, I just, the next thing after you're done with this, could you talk a little bit about Title III as well? Uh, that's crowdfunding? Yeah, I, I just was hoping for a little bit of that action. Jonathan's going to talk about crowdfunding, so I don't make a face. No, I'm, we're happy to do that. Um, I, I think, oh, I'll get back to that. Okay, so Reg A+, Plus, I think we're seeing... Um, a growing acknowledgement that it's a really nice way to raise money and also increase the field of uh, branding for your products. So I think we're seeing it in the, uh, in the branding space. When, we, when the rule first um, became effective, which is about a year ago, right, we did a um, quick survey about 12 to 15 investment banks in the tier two, tier three space. So um, Cowens and Stiefels and um, Hambrecht and like a lot of investment banks that you might be working with when you're raising capital as a private company before your big IPO. And at that point, most of them were saying they wouldn't even look at Reg A because their investors' criteria was liquidity. They cared about liquidity. Reg A plus securities are not publicly registered, so there's no secondary trading platform for them. There's no way to list them on New York or NASDAQ unless you also become public at the time you do your Reg A plus. So I think you'll see a growing number of companies utilizing Reg A plus to do a mini IPO so they be, can choose to become a public company through a Reg A offering with less disclosure, less SEC review. Um, and I think the market will stop thinking that that's a negative towards a company versus um, just being neutral to it. So I think Reg A plus has a lot of potential upside. I really do. I think it's a lower cost way for companies to raise capital. It's a lower cost way for companies to go public. It's a nice way to get retail consumers invested in interest in your company. Um, so I, I think it's getting a slow start, but I think the other thing is if we can solve the secondary liquidity program for private Reg A plus companies, you'll see more interest in investing and more investment banks willing to do the deals. Yeah. Um, uh, they are mostly um, into mergers and acquisitions in relation to others. How does this affect a, will there be a secondary or whatever you want to call a Monday market when there's money in it, there is uh, more, more people putting money into it and transactions happening, that creates a potential for a Monday. Uh, divestiture, mergers and acquisition, there are three separate categories as you know. Yeah. Can you comment on how will that affect compared to a bigger M&A market, not a million dollars? And it's going to be very important. If this M&A doesn't happen, there's no overall liquidity. I think that I can't think of why a Reg A plus company would have a different um, uh, interest point for an M&A. The size. The size boutique companies can, can now play right. more than a, a, a bigger companies normally trying to do M&A. Right. Number two, if there are few companies, with someone like me, I'll be looking at in the, in the portfolio who are all there with similar characteristics. You know, where are your characteristics? Product, company, you know, who are the customers, etc. I can do a roll up. Yeah. And the roll up has one plus plus one plus one plus one is 15, or whatever number it is. I thirsty. Yeah. Right. That is yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So Jacob Mullins will actually answer that question um, this afternoon. <laughs> um, and he's actually building a marketplace, uh, much more of a marketplace for private M&A transactions as well. Um, I think we have time for one more question. And then Title III. It, it sounded like I was, I was not getting a good feel from that question. <laughs> All right, it's not a bad feel. My feel is that I love the idea of crowdfunding a lot. I think that the structure that 
that Congress and the SEC put around crowdfunding make it unusable. Um, audited financial statements if you're raising more than $500,000, um, having to be trading, go through a registered portal, the idea of becoming a registered portal, you have to register with FINRA, you have to do due diligence, you can't tell a company you're not willing to put them on your portal. From a risk point of view, that sounds, and I'm you know, broker-dealer lawyer, that sounds um, problematic to me, that if I was the general counsel of a platform that couldn't turn down deal flow, that feels uncomfortable. And then the portals can't charge a commission. So what's driving entities to want to become a portal? I love the idea of crowdfunding. I wish that we could do it in a sensible way. And the original intent of Obama, President Obama, was to let companies raise up to like a million a year from the crowd. Um, what I've heard is that um, private company startup CEOs are not as interested in crowdfunding for a couple of reasons. One, it's a lot of work for a little bit of money. Um, you end up with a lot of human beings on your cap table who think that you should be the next Facebook, and they don't want to have to deal with IR at that level of private. They're, they're teeny, right? They're small companies. And you could end up with Neilio Motors, for example. You can end up with 14,000 shareholders on your cap table through one small deal. And that doesn't becomes... The, doesn't, the, doesn't the platform generally go off as the shareholder of record, or do each one of those Each one of those are as the shareholder record, unless it's an SPV structure. But the platform is just matching buyers with the investment. Um, so for the most part, that investor is your investor, unless you're making, it, making them come in through an SPV structure. But I think that the other thing I've heard is that VCs won't touch you at a Series A or above range because they don't want to deal with a cap table with a ton of human beings on it that were not you know, employees of the company or some other way. So some VC firms are saying, we're only gonna invest in you if you take all those people off your cap table so that you do a tender and you, it's an all or nothing. But so I heard one woman, really interesting, she created, um, I see them a lot on TV now, she created this little touch pads that you put on gloves that you can use your devices when you have your winter gloves or work gloves. And she was speaking at a conference that I went to a couple years ago and she said, I need money all the time, but I wouldn't do it through crowdfunding because I don't want people thinking that they have the right to know why I'm making my decisions at that level of company involvement. So that's, those are my thoughts about crowdfunding. I think it has a huge amount, huge amount of potential. I love the idea but I think the parameters around it make it difficult to become really helpful. That's why I think maybe Reg A Plus is another way to crowdfund with less kind of noise, if that makes any sense. It, it does so effectively, and just, I know that you need to get running, and I I'm appreciate good. this. What time is um, it? 1.45. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a big difference between Reg A, Reg, Reg a and uh, the normal. Yeah, you. So, the, and this exact topic is one that we speak a lot about on the committee, and some of us have strong feelings that the Title III should be loosened, others don't, and so there's kind of this ongoing discussion. So anybody involved with capital would seem to be thinking that it's kind of bad. I mean, it, it's, it's... I think it's, you know, it's the idea of, I think, first of all, I think Congress made it unworkable, right? In order to get it through, there were accommodations made, as I said earlier, what happens on the Hill sometimes defies explanation. People have pet rules, like it's like Sarbanes-Oxley went through the SEC, it's another set of rules that are Dodd-Frank. So there's big wedges, right? And some senator wanted conflict mineral disclosure for multiple years and kept saying to the SEC, you have to adopt conflict mineral disclosure. They thought it was a terrible idea because the cost-benefit analysis just made no sense. That if you're creating something, you're manufacturing something. You have to go to every supplier in your food chain to find out if anything comes from a conflict mineral company, country. Okay, I'm making a pair of shoes. You know, God, that would be a great job, right? I'd like that job. Do I have to find out if the rubber in the shoes that I'm using, or, you know, it's the cost benefit analysis makes no sense. But in order for Dodd Frank to pass, they gave in to that senator who put this silly piece of legislation in that's costing public companies millions of dollars a year for not a lot of benefit to the US public. So for me, crowdfunding's the same way. In order to get it done, they accepted things that make it not as attractive to a private company and less as attractive to an investor. That's just my view. And please don't quote me, ever, <laughs> to the SEC or to my company I work for, or to anyone. But otherwise, it's great. <laughs> Henry, thank you very, very much for coming and speaking. Thank you.